Thank you for having us. Well, I'm Emily Hazelwood. I'm one of the co-founders of Blue Latitudes. And I'm Amber Sparks. And today we are going to ta be talking to you about using the rigs to reef approach to accelerate ocean regeneration. We'll be talking about how these offshore oil and gas platforms have been repurposed to facilitate and host marine ecosystems. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let us just introduce Blue Latitudes LLC and who we are. We're a women-owned US-based marine environmental consulting firm, and we work on doing the ecological value assessments on offshore oil and gas platforms, determining the ecological value of each platform on a case-by-case -case basis. Our work takes us from the sea surface all the way down to the sea floor, where we use remotely operated vehicles to investigate the marine ecosystems that can be found there. But today we want to tell you a story. A story that some of you may not be aware of because from one's beach chair or from the surface, offshore oil and gas platforms look like massive industrial structures. There's, it's hard to imagine that there could be more beneath the surface. Now, there are offshore oil and gas platforms in every ocean. This particular platform is off the coast of California. There are thousands of platforms all around the world, and we'll be talking about how many of these platforms have been repurposed as reefs. But after a certain amount of time, these oil platforms have reached the end of their economic life. They're no longer producing hydrocarbons. And what happens when the oil wells dry up? Enter the engineering feat of a lifetime. How to remove a structure some the size of the Empire State Building from the sea floor. This is a process called decommissioning, and it involves sealing and capping the oil well so that there's no more drilling. Now, when that well is sealed and capped, the oil company retains liability for that well in perpetuity. So should there ever be a spill or a leak or anything like that, they're always responsible. Then they'll dismantle the top side or what you see from the surface. And then what's left is that infrastructure that's been supporting the top side and drilling facilities. It's the platform jacket, beams and cross beams. Looks like the scaffolding of a building. And that's what we'll be talking about reefing today. Now it's hard to Im imagine, but below the surface, every beam and cross beam of that platform jacket can be covered in marine life. Here, this is an offshore platform in California. We see it's covered with cold water, water corals, scallops, mussels, and enemies. You see big schools of jack mackerel. We even see some of our California state fish, the Garibaldi, that nest and make their permanent home on these structures. <clears throat> but Riggs to Reef provides an alternative to completely removing that structure. It's a option of which the oil company can modify that platform jacket so it can continue to support marine life as an artificial reef. There are a few decommissioning options when it comes to reefing. You can tow a structure to an area of ecosystem need, topple it on its side, or remove the upper 85 feet so that ships can safely draft over. Now, no matter which reefing decommissioning option is chosen, that oil well is always sealed and capped in the exact same way. And like I mentioned, the oil companies retain the liability for that. But the structure is able to is able to maintain and and continue to be in the water column to function as an artificial reef. But before we go any further, what exactly is an artificial reef? For not everything we toss into our oceans can be considered a successful reef. Although we see examples which include subway cars to um, tires to toilets, we need to really think about what considerations should go into a successful artificial reef. Let's go into some of those examples. One such example are the reef balls. And many scientists place reef balls on the seafloor to observe how marine life grows there and studies the the most effective substrate to use for artificial reef development. Another example that we see is from artists placing their installations on the seafloor to observe how the marine life that grows there actually enhances their art. 
But what makes an oil platform such a successful candidate for an artificial reef? Well, the answer lies in the structure itself. Some of these structures have become some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, and that all is due to the structure. Stretching from sea floor to sea surface, these platforms can easily be as tall as the Empire State Building, providing a lot of real estate for marine life. Additionally, these structures are very complex. Lots of beams and cross beams providing nooks and crannies for a variety of invertebrates to make their permanent homes on the structures. We also need to understand whether or not these platforms can be considered essential fish habitat. And in order to do so, we need to answer a few questions. Are these platforms necessary for fish spawning, breeding, feeding, enabling these fish communities to grow to maturity? And are they in general contributing to a healthy and sustainable ecosystem? Well, to answer those questions, we need to answer an age old question, production versus attraction. Are these platforms actually producing marine life or are they merely temporarily attracting marine life to the structure? In, order, in other words, are they necessary habitat or temporary shelter? And the way we can start to answer this question is through stable isotope chemistry. Essentially, you are what you eat. We can go into the gut of the fish to observe if what it's been eating throughout its lifetime actually originated from the platform structure itself. Now we're going to take you on a little trip around the world because there are not just oil platforms in California in the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, there are oil platforms in almost every ocean on the planet. All right, so here we see a map of the globe. The red and blue areas represent oil and gas fields, oil and gas reserves. The yellow represents where we are actively drilling on those fields. As you can see, drilling is highly concentrated along the shorelines and offshore. In fact, in almost every ocean, we are actively drilling for offshore oil and gas resources. So with all this development offshore, you would think that a rigs to reef program would be a decommissioning alternative that was widely accepted around the world. However, this is not the case. There are only a few places that have rigs to reef programs. We see one in California, in the Gulf of Mexico. We also see some developing in Malaysia and Thailand. But first, we'll take a look at California, where in 2010, former Governor Schwarzenegger signed in the Riggs Reef Law. However, since its time, none of California's 27 offshore platforms have been reefed. Now, this stands in stark contrast to the Gulf of Mexico, where they've been actively repurposing their structures as reefs for over 30 years. In fact, they have over 500 platforms that have been successfully repurposed as reefs. Off the coast of South Carolina, a private investor purchased one of these structures and repurposed it into a bed and breakfast. Now, this model is also seen off the coast of Malaysia, um, where they have repurposed a structure for ecotourism. This is the Sea Ventures dive rig, and divers, tourists can go and stay on the platform and then dive the platform jacket and on the surrounding reef ecosystems. Our last stop is going to be off the coast of Gabon, where Dr. Enrique Sala, National Geographic Explorer, went and researched some of these platforms. What he found is that while commercial trawling had degraded the ecosystems surrounding these platforms, the platforms themselves were hotspots for life. And his research actually got those platforms incorporated into Africa's largest marine park. Welcome back from your trip. Now we'll weigh some of the pros and cons of this program. The first con that we see is the lack of global legislation. For although most countries have an artificial reef program, 
a rigs to reefs program is a different beast entirely. You need to think about every country's unique ecosystems, their economics, their cultural value, the socioeconomic values, in order to make the program successful. We see this just in the differences between the Gulf of Mexico and California. Both states are within the United States. However, one has a thriving and successful rig series program and California does not yet. The next con that we see is the possible spread of invasive species. In the Gulf of Mexico, where this photo was taken, we see the spread of invasive species such as the lionfish, as well as orange cup coral or tabastria. Scientists have been looking into this question and have learned that while yes, these platforms act as stepping stones, enabling these species to spread to other parts of our oceans, they are not doing so at an overall greater rate than natural reefs in the region. Another con that we've identified is the lack of public understanding. For when an oil company comes around and says they're going to leave an oil platform in the ocean or abandon it as an artificial reef, the public interprets this as greenwashing. In other words, they don't believe that an oil company or an oil platform could possibly be a successful candidate for an artificial reef. For the most part, the public associates oil platforms with natural with man-made disasters, such as the BP oil spill or the Exxon Valdez. It's very hard to understand how an oil platform could, could contribute to an overall healthy ecosystem. Another con that we note is that once a platform is either built to extract hydrocarbons or reefed in place, it will prevent other ocean users from using that region. For example, trawlers. These platforms present obstructions on the ocean floors, preventing trawl fishermen from taking their nets along the ocean bottom. Now, while trawling can be a very destructive practice, it's like taking a net the size of a football field and dragging it over the ocean bottom, it's also a really important um, economic source for many countries, and it can't be discounted if you want to have a successful rigs to reefs program. Now we'll take a look at some of the pros, such as the potential for these structures to enhance our local fisheries by creating a refuge for marine life to spawn, breed, and grow to maturity. We also see these structures compensating for near shore habitat loss as pollution, runoff, overfishing degrades our natural reefs. What we're finding is that many species are moving offshore and making their permanent home on these structures. There's also the potential to reduce pollution by repurposing existing materials. Emily mentioned earlier that in some areas, we are throwing subway cars into the ocean. We are trying to create hard substrate so that we can enhance our oceans. Now, in many cases, this can be a good, a good thing, but what we're seeing here is that these have already developed into artificial reefs. And if we can repurpose them so to let that artificial reef to con continue to thrive, that it could be a benefit and a good reuse of this structure. Alternatively, decommissioning these platform jackets can be incredibly taxing on the environment, depending on where you are. In places like California, where we actually don't have the infrastructure on shore to properly dismantle some of these structures, what we would do is they'd be cut up into pieces and put on a derrick barge sent across the Pacific to be dismantled in Southeast Asia. The second those barges go outside of our state waters, they switch from diesel to bunker fuel. And bunker fuel makes diesel look like champagne. It just has a massive carbon footprint associated with it. So we're looking for opportunities to reuse this material so that we can reduce the pollution and with, that comes with decommissioning. Another pro we see is a potential for ecotourism. This is just getting started. They see a model of this at the Sea Ventures dive rig where it's actually attracting divers from around the world to come and explore this really unique dive opportunity. And there's a potential to support local economies by repurposing these, structure, these structures for ecotourism. So now we wanted to open up the floor to questions and thank you all for your time and for having us here today. 
Thanks, Amber and Emily. You're very kind. Um, you're probably the quickest presentation we've had so far in this uh, in this series. Um, I'm sure that uh, you'll get a few questions uh, regarding uh, uh, fisheries and uh, species loss. Um, could I ask my friend Francesco Ricciardi if he would like to add something to this? Francesco, you're online, right? Yes, I uh, am. Yeah. So I wasn't expecting to be called, but <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steven. Thank you, uh, Emily and Amber, for the presentation. It was very interesting. And um, I have just something to share with you. So um, uh, recently, we proposed a project to one of our government in the in, uh, for ADB and a grant for this project. And the government refused that because they say they didn't not, they don't support active coral restoration. They believe that only passive coral restoration is uh, is possible. It looks very unusual to me, this thing. So I wanted to ask you, you, you consider this risk to reef approach an active or a passive uh, coral growth or restoration? So uh, at least I can answer to, to these government officers. I mean, we, we see that um rigs to reefs is certainly an act of, I mean the act of converting an oil platform into an artificial reef permanently is at, is an active you know production of an artificial reef however while the platforms are standing they naturally produce their own coral reefs just from the nature of how coral spawn and spread in the water column they will interact with the platform and begin producing their own coral polyps begin producing their own reefs so the platforms in and of themselves, while they are an unnatural structure, they do produce natural reefs. When you reef them and you make the decision as to how you're going to reef it, whether you place it on the sea floor or you tow it to an alternative location, that could be viewed as more of an active placement of the reef. However, if you chose to reef it in place and leave it standing, it would be passive. Thank you. That's uh, that was very clear. And I, I also want to add that uh, I, I've recently been diving a, a bit in the Mediterranean since I'm back in Italy, and I've noticed that we have a dramatic problem of overfishing. There is no fish left anywhere. So um, I hope that we have a lot of this structure in the Mediterranean Sea as well. And uh, I really hope that we can do something in here because it can be a uh, easy way to repopulate some of the areas. We face a lot of issues with um, near shore erosion and runoff. Hard substrate or materials that corals will grow on are becoming relatively rare in our oceans. So if we continue to lose that hard substrate, we continue to lose our fish populations and we need to replace that in somehow in some way. Thank you. Back to you, Steve. Thanks, Francesco. I'm going to call on Nguyen, who's our, uh, our marine hydrogen expert for this uh, for the Mar STA. Nguyen, your, you please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. First of all, a very interesting and useful presentation. It shows how the way we think about the commission the offshore work. Uh, also, I'm the marine hydrogen, uh, but I have been looking at the offshore. Uh, uh, work as well. So the question is, um, you have any recommendation for the offshore work, especially the winter by offshore winter by uh, at the moment in terms of the shape, uh, the color of the foundation, and especially the floating foundation that especially to be um, grow in next few years. Yeah, so if I if I understand your question, were you asking about how this concept could apply to other industries such as offshore wind or other structures like floating structures? Yes, exactly. So, okay. so far, what you mentioned about the oil gas platform uh, rig to reef, but um, we got whether it's applicable for offshore re renewable energy, for example, oil, sorry, offshore wind, and then future is for wave and tidal energy. Any relation with the shape and the color of those uh, offshore work? Yeah. 
So in, in order to make it attractive uh, for the bio marine biology? That's a great question. We are seeing that an energy transition offshore where we're moving away from offshore oil and gas towards renewables with the installation of offshore wind farms quickly picking up around the world. And what we're hoping to do is learn from what we've from the what we've taken from this experience with oil and gas development offshore and site the offshore wind farms in a way that not only generates productive offshore wind power, but they can also act as platforms for marine life and habitat habitats because although a wind turbine is when from the sea surface, it looks just like one pole. It's supported on a very similar infrastructure as what we see with an offshore platform. Often it has many legs. It has beams and cross beams and supporting infrastructure very similar to what we see with offshore oil and gas. Understanding that we can assume that there is potential for those structures to also attract and eventually produce marine life. So our hope is that we can get on the front end of offshore wind and encourage those companies that are building them offshore to not only think strategically about wind generation, but also about how the placement and siting of these structures can benefit the marine environments. Thank you. Uh, Rear Admiral Nick Latham, I believe the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> That's, um... Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Emily and Amber. I, I really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, to me, rigs to reefs is a complete no brainer. It's an absolute no brainer, and I really applaud what you've done. My question really follows on from Nguyen, um, uh, which is how do we scale this? How do we how do we legislate that if you are going to put offshore infrastructure uh, in place, you must incorporate a rigs to reef approach because the what you've explained is that you get a rigs to reef approach right from the beginning it's not just when you decommission the platform we used to say in shipbuilding that air and steel are cheap so um, if you want to bung a few more cross beams in um, you could provide a better habitat what's what will drive that will be a business case to make it worthwhile so have you any knowledge of uh, the numbers that go with this so uh, I, it's an incredibly difficult question to ask. But for example, what is what is the value of the ecological life that is generated by a rig on average? You know, is it is it X million or what? Um, are, are there any studies that have been done on that which um, enable you to build a business case? Well, I can I'll answer the first part of your question and I'll let Amber answer the second part with regards to the value of these structures. Um, but we are, you know, the interesting thing about this program is that decommissioning is becoming more relevant. It wasn't very relevant or on the forefront of everyone's mind 10, 20, 30 years ago because the production of oil and gas was booming. Um, and most countries were in the very much the development phases. Now we're starting to see that countries are shifting their focus where they're making the decision to remove their offshore platforms, even though they're still installing them, they're removing them at a grade that's rate greater than the installation rate. So all of a sudden this question of how to manage the decommissioning, how to best save money on the decommissioning is um, cropping up exponentially. Um, and we've started seeing that, for example, in California, we've had a rigs to reach program for 10 years, but we've never implemented a platform because it's because of difficulties within the law. However, decommissioning is once again on the forefront of California's mind with the decommissioning of Platform Holly and several others looming. And that's beginning to change. We're seeing discussions around rigs to reefs. We're seeing this um, also in Malaysia, where we've seen several oil companies start to in investigate opportunities to reef their platforms in place. We see this in the Gulf of Thailand, which has just started to implement their own rigs to reef program. So we believe that it's slowly starting to pick up steam. And the reason it hasn't been prior to that is because really 
oil and gas was king. And now we've started to move into more renewables offshore. Additionally, the question of how to decommission these renewable sources, such as offshore wind farms, a lot of lessons will be learned from how we decommission these oil platforms. So I do think there'll be a lot of takeaways for future development offshore. And to answer your question in regards to the value of these structures as as reefs, so every platform that's acting as an artificial reef is mimicking the environment in which it's been placed. So it's difficult to give it a general you know, value of, okay, this ecosystem is worth X. They really need to be looked at on a case by case basis, but there has been some some figures on the actual cost of decommissioning and what can be saved through the reefing process because decommissioning it can be a highly expensive endeavor and this is i think what motivates you asked how do we get legislative participation in this program and i think what will motivate our legislators most is the decommissioning costs and the potential cost savings at the end of life. I think that is what really is going to motivate them. And since this is a presentation we're talking about uh, the ADB and the Asia Pacific region, I will share some numbers from the um, South Pacific. So some estimates that or excuse me from uh, South China Sea that have been taken there on decommissioning costs. So the average removal cost in the Asia Asia Pacific region is 35 million. Actually here, let me, I can just share this little slide with you. This might help be helpful. Okay, so the it costs 35 million to, for an average removal cost in the Asia Pacific region, or approximately 13 million to convert that same platform to a reef via rig street program. So that's a potential savings of 22 million per structure. Now in the United States, the way that our government has legislated that cost savings, it's split 50-50. 50% goes back to the state into an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. It funds the Department of Fish and Wildlife, artificial reefing programs, etc. The other 50% remains with the oil company stakeholders. Now in the Asia Pacific region, many of the operators are also the government. So it's going to be a different cost sharing structure but hope that those numbers will remain the same. And again, remember that this is per an average 6,000 ton platform. So I just wanted to share these numbers with you because I think when it does come time to um, motivate legislators that these are the numbers that will, will likely really do so. Yeah, I, th I think that's really helpful. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, the the decommissioning costs I was aware of, but it seems to me there's a there's a through life value to this, uh, which will be incredibly hard to work out. There's a, but if if we're talking about a regenerative approach, which is the Mara's approach, then designing the value of the offshore infrastructure as a, as a reef from the outset over it over from its installation through its operational life through its decommissioning and actually if you think about the the massive growth of offshore wind planning how you will decommission from the get-go as part of the licensing process you know are you going to are you going to chop the legs off all of them and stick them down as one big massive reef what well, what are you going to do with them you could build a value into that but you have to think about how the study would be done that's really thought provoking. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and you, you actually bring up a good point. Um, and that's actually a challenge right now we face with the Rig Series program with regards to liability is when we think about building these structures with the end in mind about whether or not there's a possibility of reefing, most countries don't have any sort of Rig Series alternative available. So from an oil company or a wind perspective, there's risk associated with assuming you can um, convert these platforms into artificial reefs. And that's something we're hoping that in the next few years can be continued to be addressed. It's, you know, it's it's very prevalent in the Gulf of Mexico. We're seeing other countries start to do these ecological value assessments, but we're hoping that that program infrastructure can start to be developed so that it becomes a more viable option for these companies. Just to jump in before Belinda Bramley uh, asks her question, that might be a good thing for us to study in this 
in uh, the Maris project, Nick, don't you think? That's just what I was thinking. Exactly <laughs> that. Well, yes. Well, we might need some help studying that, ladies. So um, now I'm going to ask uh, Melinda Bramley to ask her question. Sorry to keep you waiting, Melinda. Not at all, Steve. Thanks very much. And uh, and thank you, uh, Amber and Emily. It was a super interesting um, presentation. Um, I've actually got two or three questions if, if there's time. <laughs> Hopefully they're quick to answer. Um, so one thing I wondered, I'm not familiar with what uh, materials reef uh, the rig structures are made of, but I just wondered if there's been any study of whether there's any um, sort of contamination effect over time of, of the reef structure uh, and whether there's impacts on the on the um, the animals that colonise the reefs. Um, and then secondly, uh, I don't know if you want, I'll fire them all out quickly if I may. And then um, I just wanted to. at all or is it genuinely additional productivity so that's the second question and then the third was i wondered whether you thought about conducting science on the on the structures so installing sensors or cameras to, to test various hypotheses about the deeper waters being a re climate refuge maybe for the shallower uh, corals so yeah thank you Great. Well, I can I'll take this first one of the material that the structure is made out of. It is made of all the platforms are made of galvanized steel and they have looked to see how this how this material degrades over time. And the only other example we can really look to are are shipwrecks, things that have been in the a similar type of material that's been in the water column for for many years. And what they found is that these structures will likely need, uh, will likely have a lifespan of approximately 300 years before they need any kind of maintenance. The degradation of the galvanized steel jackets is slower than what you would find on a, a ship or any other sunken material because it's completely covered and encrusted with invertebrate life, which presents, which slows the oxidation of the actual metal itself because it's got this sort of protective layer of muscles and scallops that have completely encrusted that structure. And they've also tested for any sort of contamination from that galvanized steel. Is it releasing metals over time that could negatively impact the surrounding environment? And what they found is that there is a small per percentage of, of metals that are being released, but they are at the same levels as background in the ocean and so there wasn't it wasn't a significant increase it wasn't any in california they collect um, broodstock for our aquaculture facilities so scallops um, mussels they actually go to the platforms to collect broodstock and they wanted to make sure that those um, species that they were collecting from the platforms weren't contaminated or anything like that. So there's been a lot of studies done to make sure that the not only that the water in the surrounding area is not at a significant um, metal discharge level above the surrounding environment, but also that the fish species and invertebrate invertebrate species that are filter feeding and living on the structures don't carry a high metal rate when compared to other other species. So that gives us confidence that the material can last for a significant amount of time and that it won't create a negative impact um, cumulatively to the ocean rather than a, be a positive impact. I'll take your second question with regards to productivity. Um, we, you know, this is again a question that would, I think would need to be addressed regionally, um, you know, every region is going to be a little bit different because of the species that you're observing. Um, the one who studied this most extensively in California is Dr. Milton Love, um, and he specifically looked at rockfish populations in California, and his research has actually found that most, if not all, of the adult species of rockfish are now found on the platforms. Um, this is mostly because of the degradation and loss of hard substrate due to coastal development. So in this case, he's found even that when they um, actually remove some of the platforms that the rockfish would go to other platforms. And they've actually found that the rockfish will move in different species, such as the capazon, will move between platforms. So there's a lot of 
um, relationship value with these platforms for those species. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, they've looked at this with the red snapper as well um, and found the same thing, that these platforms are actually producing red snappers. Now, are they taking it from other reefs in the region? It, that's more of a difficult question to answer, but when they've done the tagging studies and when they've done um, some eDNA work on these structures, they found that the platforms are producing their own stock as opposed to attracting it from other reefs. But of course, it's something that we'd want to look at regionally to make sure that we're seeing the similar case done in other regions of the world. And then and for your well, last question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, what was it? I couldn't remember what the last question was again. Yeah, it was just about the opportunity to do science on the um, on the structure. Um, so to put sensors or cameras uh, on on the um, platforms to um, so you can get data for you know other questions yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah, yeah. so that is, that is something that has been um on, only recently really implemented there is a group called the gulf or gulf research offshore institute gori or gulf offshore research institute and they are based in the gulf of mexico they are taking decommissioned platforms and installing scientific equipment on them, as well as investigating alternatives such as um, wave energy storage, uh, batteries offshore. They are thinking about potentially creating a, a research station. There's a lot of work to analyze and assess these, the value of these ecosystems. However, I'm not aware of many oil company operators that are, while they are actively drilling oil and gas, are also monitoring their ecosystems to with equipment and things that are permanently below the surface. This might be for liability reasons or, or for other reasons, but any sort of scientific studies tend to begin to take place. When they begin to think about decommissioning, they want to assess that ecosystem and then sort of looking at long term value. And I actually do think there there is one researcher who's gotten permits in the North Sea. His name is um, Yo Kulin um, and he's some, uh, had some recent publications and I'm fairly certain that he actually was able to get permits to leave some sensors on the oil platforms. But at, to Amber's point, usually it's a liability issue that, because they're active. Um, that you don't get as much of it on the active platforms, but I do believe that Yope did have some publications on sensors he had on the platforms. Brilliant, uh, really interesting anyway. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, before we jump to GK, um, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, one of the reasons why they don't put a lot of uh, sensors on those platforms is they're extensively used for diving for special forces training in Australia. The rigs in the, the south of Victoria are the SAS, Australian SAS train there all the time. Okay, so now I'm going to ask ask GK Ong, who's an oil and gas, who's a shipping uh, yard guy who I've known for a while. To GK, you want to ask some questions? Hey, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting presentation. I was in the marine uh, field before, you know, shipbuilding repairs and stuff like that. So it's quite interesting and I used to do, I was actually the hull engineer and a coatings engineer and stuff like that. So it's not a worry about the paint and so forth because for many years the use of copper, you know, uh, derivatives have been banned so it's a long time. Um, I want to ask you uh, two questions. One is that um, when these rigs were put in position years ago, obviously nobody really thought about, well, shall we make that into reefs? And I imagine that if I have a government say, well, you put it there, you just take it away. Would that be a, what are the challenges in convincing people that's a good thing to have it there, you know, convert it to a reef? The fact is that, you know, how can you convince people? Obviously the saving is very good, you know, uh, that's one. Now these jack cups uh, rigs, they're obviously here sticking down in the ground. Uh, they are the very bigger, exploration rigs, you know, six, eight lakes that wander around the place. So I assume that if they are too old, they'll be taken somewhere for scrap, but it could also be decommissioned and, you know, sunk, so to speak. But what are the challenges and solutions? 
Yeah, well, so uh, just at, to answer your first question about your you're correct when they initially put these structures in the water column, it was with the understanding that the operator would completely remove them through the decommissioning process and restore the seabed to its original condition. Now, many companies when they actually face decommissioning realize the exorbitant costs, they are seeking for alternatives and there are, you know, many structures have developed into these reef ecosystems, so they're looking for an opportunity to repurpose them. There are some oil companies who have attempted to put information about and educate people about these reef ecosystems into the public sphere, but it often comes across as greenwashing, where an oil company is just saying that they've got this reef ecosystem, but the public is smart and they're go they are thinking, oh, you just want to save money and not have to follow your follow through with your responsibility to remove it. So that has not typically worked in the past. What we found is that some of the most effective ways to communicate the value of these structures is to share it through media engagements, taking pictures, videos, and really having sound science on the value of these ecosystems. In the Gulf of Mexico and California, they've been studying these platforms for many, many years. And then in areas like the North Sea, there's basically only one researcher who's done any research on those platforms. And so they don't have as robust of a of a scientific understanding of the value of the structures. And therefore it's more challenging to communicate to, to the general public about the value of these ecosystems. So I think that having a strong scientific understanding of the value and communicating it through visual media is a really effective way to talk to stakeholders about about these ecosystems and um, so that that's been a, a method and a tool that we've really worked on is is using that um, as a way to way to communicate and then for your second question regarding some of these larger exploration platforms um, in many cases those platform structures actually make for better reefs because they're larger more real estate yep. they're more complex more beams and cross beams and Although those have been, they're kind of new on the decommissioning scene, we ourselves have worked on unique projects in the Gulf of Mexico that have involved those much, much larger structures because those are where the costs are most exorbitant. They mm -hmm. tend to be in deeper water, which means they're much farther from ports. So just to tow it to port is much more expensive. Um, in those cases, we're starting to see more rigs to reefs projects associated with those platforms. We know they make for good reefs. You need to have the consideration about how deep in the water you, you're reefing it. For you know, if you place a platform onto its side in 2,000 feet of water, it's most likely it'll one have a much greater impact on the sea bottom environment, but two, you're not going to get the same robust ecosystem that you'd see in shallower systems. However, towing those structures to shallower water environments you would see a more productive reef um, and you would be able to save by towing not as great of a distance. We're also seeing alternative structures such as spars beginning to be reefed. The first one that was reefed was the Red Hawk spar in the Gulf of Mexico um, and that was starting to pave the way for other alternative structures to be reefed. Okay, thank you. So GK, there's a new business there. You talk to your mates in Singapore and you know, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would I would like to ask a question if I could. Um, the Lex Luther in me always likes to think about real estate, and um, Emily, you just mentioned it before. But you, you're effectively creating or, or you're repurposing real estate. Um, have you looked at the um, the value, perhaps, of not fully um, removing the reefs that the rigs above waterline, but repurposing them for other activities. There was a recent uh, announcement by a company by, by which company looking at putting batteries, a uh, hydrogen plant and linking up to offshore wind um, from an old rig in the north in, I think it was off the coast of Denmark. I think that's where it was. I'm not sure I can't remember the details. But one of the things we're looking at is to see whether or not we can derive more value from the assets we have. Do you think that there's a market for 
leaving, removing the oil infrastructure, capping the reef, and then putting on things like, um, you know, potentially linking up to hydrogen, lining up with aquaculture, looking at sensors, looking at additional activities. Do you think there's a market in that or that's a bridge too far right now? I absolutely think there's a market in that. Um, you know, again, it comes back to the case by case basis because, you know, for example, platforms in California, some of the oldest ones are from the 60s and 70s. Older platforms require a lot more maintenance um, in the water column versus some of the newer ones. But we do see a lot of newer platforms where the oil well might not have been pro as productive as they once thought it was going to be. And the structure is actually in great condition. And in those cases, um, and this is what the Gulf of Offshore Research Institute is starting to look at, is the potential to convert these platforms into wind farms, into offshore aquaculture. And we do see the aquaculture harvesting um, in California, where they harvest broodstock off these platforms. So, you know, it's a great example of, you know, the whole reduce, reuse, recycle. In this case, it would be repurpose. Um, because you're repurposing these existing materials, which, you know, galvanized steel is in, does incredibly well in the water column. We know this. It can last a long time. The top side structures, some of the largest ones, can house 100 to 150 people. So you could really uh, make the case to convert them into either a research station or convert it into a wind farm where you'd have crew be able to stay on top of the platform. There's excellent potential for these platforms to serve other purposes. Um, and in fact, in many cases, especially when you think about research, their location is unique. The hardest part about getting any sort of research vessel or any research activities offshore is, you know, you're having to drive offshore and go do it. If you could have a team there for months at a time, it'd be an excellent opportunity to conduct research. So um, then one of the things that we we were currently working in the Marshall Islands and um, in Palau, and we're just about to engage in uh, consultations with those both those governments. And of course, the Marshall Islands has a lot of uh, wrecks related to nuclear testing in some of the northern parts of the country. But um, that there is some experience there in that activity. But the thing that's interesting to us is that when we talk to Malaysia, um, who are very interested in the Mares project, they have a significant problem with red tides because of effluent runoff. And um, looking at facilities that could actually um, alleviate their problem with cyanobacteria and red tides would be significant. Do you see an opportunity to link mariculture or um, any bioremediation with this, or do you think that's another, is that a step too far as well? Well, you know what, anything is, is really possible. And these structures could definitely be used, repurposed for remediation purposes. Right now, um, a lot of reefing these structures, the greatest value is retained when you leave the structure in place and just remove the upper 85 feet so ships can safely draft over. It creates the least amount of disturbance to the ecosystems. However, there are cases where you can pick them, pick the whole jacket up and move it to an area of ecosystem need or perhaps an area where you have ideas for remediation. I haven't heard of it being used to remediate in that specific way, but I do know that in the Marshall Islands and Palau, they have, like you said, many artificial structures, um, many relics from, from World War II that have that are currently underwater and perhaps those could be used as a case study to understand how they react in that environment and then you know it could put, be a potential use um, to bring in decommissioned platforms for remediation. I, I think the challenge is getting people to think in a different way and look at a different set of opportunities. One of the things we're going to try and do is create some demonstrate how we can create some value. So Nick's comment about how do we demonstrate a mechanism to share with governments where the opportunities are. I think um, the secondary values from rigs to reefs for biomass creation, uh, sensors, the addition of linking on to additional industries actually is probably another revenue stream and it would be really interesting to see if we could get some research done on that to get some estimates on that. I think that would be very, very useful to us and for the developing member countries within ADB because, you know, obviously they're the ones who are going to benefit from this. Could I ask if anybody has a last question? I think everyone's a bit tired.
<laughs> I know I am. It's been a long day. Um, it's Mike. Um, it's hey, one. Mike, go ahead. <laughs> I you know this might be uh, maybe fairly well, off. Do you yeah. want to identify yourself? Yeah, yes, this is Michael Abundo. Um, I'm the marine renewable energy um, expert in the uh, Mars team. So I just wanted to ask something related to marine renewables. Um, really, how do you think um, the rigs to reef might be augmented if we did consider um, putting in marine renewable energy as part of that program? Um, I know you may have longer answers to this, but yeah, maybe a quick <laughs> two, three minute uh, answer from each of you would be would be nice to have. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think where, you know, we're seeing what's essentially when you were going, if you're going to convert a platform to support offshore wind, you would need to decommission um, all of the wells. So plug and cap all the wells as if you were going to actually completely remove the platform and you'd remove the drilling infrastructure. So all that you would be left with is the steel, the galvanized steel jacket and the top side. Um, some of the challenges that I know people have been looking into with regards to repurposing them for wind or wave energy is the battery storage and how to convert or get that power from the platform on shore. But that's becoming less and less of an issue just because many of these platforms, a lot of these platforms are very close to the shoreline. So we already see these link ups with existing power stations. Um, I know that on the East Coast, they're looking to build wind farms, but they're going to be linking up to existing power stations. For example, there's a nuclear power plant in New Hampshire that's going to be decommissioned, and they're planning on rerouting the wind power through the power, the old power plant. Um, so I think the challenge is making sure to, um, you know, the decommissioning aspect is not very challenging. It's standard. They'd have to do that anyways. Um, and then just retrofitting the platform so that it can support um, wave or wind energy or aquaculture. Mike, is that what you're looking for? Uh, um, that's probably half of it, yeah. Uh, do you see okay. any, any more uh, augmentative, uh, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, some synergies uh, that you'd find um, if you wanted to, um, well, it was mentioned that we didn't want to maybe look at actively doing it in some countries, um, but to accelerate growth or of the corals, for instance, bio rock technology, for instance, or were there other things that could be done to um, maybe improve the productivity or proliferate or accelerate certain um, processes um, with additional energy? Yes, so that's that's definitely being done right now. Actually, in Australia, they are adding in. They look similar to the reef balls that Emily presented on. They are um, concrete structures that they place surrounding other artificial reef sites, and they're hoping to place them around any future reef sites off in Australian waters. And that would, the purpose of that would be to enhance the marine ecosystem. There's this idea of habitat connectivity, and that the more structures, more hard substrate you have in close proximity, the more likely those ecosystems are to flourish and this hat this model has been um, also implemented in the gulf of mexico where in louisiana their department of fish and wildlife has designated reef planning areas so many decommissioned platforms are towed to these reef planning areas and it's a specific bound area in which many platforms 